Dear loving Father in heaven, thank you for giving us the privilege of life. And thank you, Lord, for providing the basic necessities that we need to survive. In all things, we have to give you thanks. And regardless of our illness or our strength or whatever situation we find ourselves, we know that all things work together for our good. And we say thank you, Lord. Our greatest desire is for us to be in your kingdom and that our love for you may increase seeing all that you have done for us dear father we pray that you shed your love abroad in our hearts and that you help us to show our love for you in the way you asked us to by keeping your commandments many times we fail in doing this so dear lord we pray that as we fellowship with you now that you shall grant us of your spirit that we, you will increase our love for you and that we will learn things that will help us to know how to show this love. Thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering our prayers. In Jesus' name I've prayed. Amen. Conflict and Courage September 14 A Man of Action It pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 6 While Nehemiah implored the help of God, he did not fold his own hands, feeling that he had no more care or responsibility in the bringing about of his purpose to restore Jerusalem. With admirable prudence and forethought, he proceeded to make all the arrangements necessary to ensure the success of the enterprise. The example of this holy man should be a lesson to all the people of God, that they are not only to pray in faith, but to work with diligence and fidelity. How many difficulties we encounter, how often we hinder the working of providence in our behalf, because prudence, forethought, and painstaking are regarded as having little to do with religion. This is a grave mistake. It is our duty to cultivate and to exercise every power that will render us more efficient workers for God careful consideration and well-matured plans are as essential to the success of sacred enterprises today as in the time of Nehemiah. Men of prayer should be men of action. Those who are ready and willing will find ways and means of working. Nehemiah did not depend upon uncertainties. The means which he lacked, he solicited from those who were able to bestow. The Lord still moves upon the hearts of kings and rulers in behalf of his people. Those who are laboring for him are to avail themselves of the help that he prompts men to give for the advancement of his cause. These men may have no sympathy with God's work no faith in Christ, no acquaintance with his word, but their gifts are not on this account to be refused. As long as we are in this world, as long as the Spirit of God strives with the children of men, so long are we to receive favors as well as to impart them. We are to give to the world the light of truth as revealed in the scriptures, and we are to receive from the world that which God moves upon them to give in behalf of his cause. Oh, that Christians might realize more and still more fully that it is their privilege and their duty while cherishing right principles to take advantage of every heaven-sent opportunity for advancing God's kingdom in this world. Amen. The title of our devotion for today is A Man of Action. We left off looking at how Nehemiah had a holy purpose in his heart 
to do a work that was necessary to be done. And the Lord prospered him when he entered into the place of the king and he had made plans beforehand. And we'll continue to look at this principle that as Christians, we are not to depend on uncertainties, uncertainties or depend on luck, but we are to work hard. Look now at Nehemiah chapter 2 from verse 4 to 8, it says, Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my fathers, of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, For how long shall thy journey be? And when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come into Judah. And a letter unto Asaph the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace which appertained to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Amen. We have already read in the devotion how it is that as Christians, we are not to depend on uncertainties. The example of Nehemiah here is a lesson to us that it is not just prayer in faith that is important, but we are to work with diligence and fidelity. We are to lay down our plans and present them to God for it to be carried out or given up according as His providence may dictate. We must have the character of God. And this lesson is something that needs to be etched very much in the minds of Christians. The children of this world are wiser in their generations than, than the children of God. It's the words that Jesus said. And why is this? Because too many Christians are depending on miracles. And I wish I could say this over and over again. As a Christian, you disappoint God when you fail to use your God-given abilities in your mental capacity and in your physical capacity and in the natural resources you have around you to do things but you're expecting some kind of magic or some kind of miracle to do things for you. God has given us these talents, the talent of our strength, the talent of our mind and the talent of resources for us to do things to think, to work. Part of the character of God is that He is a planner. He is a master worker. He is an artificial. He is a businessman also. And you see in the parables of Jesus where He talks about business and how to make profit from business. So basically, our devotion for today will be looking at two things the importance of diligence in business and also the concept or the mindset of receiving means and support from areas where possible and seizing opportunities, taking opportunities. We talked about that a bit yesterday when we said we are to see opportunities where they are and take advantage of them. But let us talk about diligence in business. Nehemiah, when he came to the king, was asked concerning his plans to go to Jerusalem and he gave the king well matured plans telling the king what he wanted to do and how he was going about it going about it and the resources that he would need how did Nehemiah know this because he had researched remember that he waited for four months before he seized the opportunity that came to him so also we are to ensure that we have well matured plans and well laid plans when we want to convince someone of our project and how can we convince someone with well matured plans it's not just to tell them this is what i want to do you have to tell them about your strategies and how you have analyzed everything about that project convincing 
whoever wants to involve with you, your stakeholders, that it is possible to do it and what benefit it is going to give to whoever it is going to benefit, especially to the stakeholders. Reading from Councils on Stewardship, page 274, paragraph 2, it says, Those who have charge of our sanitariums should move guardedly. There are times when they see, they will see little increase. Let them act with wisdom and tact and adaptability. Let them study and practice the instruction of Christ given in regard to building a tower. Forethought is of far more value than afterthought. When a neglect of wise calculation and careful management is plainly seen to result in failure, Managers who are slack, who do not know how to manage, should be separated from the work. Secure the services of men and women who know how to bind about the edges so that the work shall not ravel out. End of quote. Do you know what this is saying? I'll take it little by little. It talks about adaptability. Let them act with wisdom and tact and adaptability. What is adaptability? That means you know your risks. When you are going on a project, you have analyzed it. There's something called the risk mapping or a risk matrix where you put your severity of the risk, that is the impact that the risk is going to have if it occurs, against the likelihood of that risk. And you tell yourself, take every risk and you need to know your risk first of all. Analyze the project you want to do. Is it a sanitarium you want to build or a school or you want to go country living or you want to, you want to build a church or go on an evangelism? You have to check all the risks. For example, the environment I'm going to, what are the things acceptable there? What are the things that will make me to be acceptable and the things that would make me to be rejected by the people? I risk losing my ground if i do this or do that or if i do this i'll be accepted you need to know the risk you also need to know your strategic risks if i take this particular step or i miss or i do not plan as i should like he talked about tact that is your tactics your strategy if you do not have a tactics or strategy or your strategy is ob- obsolete outdated you risk losing your ground and not achieving what you want to achieve and the operational risk also if you do not know how to use the equipments that you have in going for any project you will fail and there are so many other risks that exist you need to know all these risks and then adapt to them know when to quit if your risk is high and the impact of that risk, that's the likelihood of the risk is very high, the impact of that risk also will also be very high, then you may want to consider not even going on that project at all. Some people enter into projects that are clearly going to fail because they did not analyze. If you analyze and realize, okay, the likelihood that this thing, this risk is going to happen is great, okay, no problem. But if the impact of that risk is very low, then you can choose to ignore it. How about when it is medium? You may want to offset, you may want to outsource the risk to be handled by someone else if the likelihood is high and the severity, if the likelihood is medium and the severity is medium. You can go and look at it in risk mapping. You just have to know your risk first of all and then the severity of that risk and know what to do. Don't let things take you by surprise. That's the meaning of four thoughts. Afterthought means, oh, this thing has taken me by surprise. I don't know what to do right now. I didn't plan for this thing happening. That is because you were probably expecting miracles from the Lord. You are to do all that you can. Know all that you can about what you want to do. Analyze everything. Have a contingency plan. If this happens, this is what I will do. If that happens, this is what I will do. How about when my cash runs out? Remember, we just read now. Follow the instruction of Christ in regard to building a tower. What's that instruction? In the book of Luke chapter 14, reading from verse about 28 and downward going down to 33, Jesus talked about planning. He said, which of you? want to build a house and will not plan first lest when you begin you stop along the way because you couldn't have the funds to continue or something or something happened or somebody who wants to go for a battle wouldn't you check whether with 20,000 you can meet the other person's I'm just using arbitrary numbers 50,000 Jesus is in support of planning 
well-matured plans laid down with strategies, tactics, analysis, risk management, risk mapping. All these things are to be done to know whether you should even embark on the project or not. Or if you are embarking on it, you know what to do when you meet various risks. We will see subsequently in the devotion how Nehemiah already had plans for various risks that he was going to meet and how he did meet them. The ones that were likely and the ones that had severe consequences. But then the likelihood was not so high, but he planned for all these things. Christians should understand this important principle. We are not to be depending on luck. We are to make well matured plans. We are not to depend on miracles. We are to strategize. We are to use our faculties that the Lord has given to us. And while doing that, we are to pray. An example from the life of Joshua is going to show us this. I like to read this part of Joshua's life. He he had a promise to conquer his enemies in a day one day but he did not relax relax his efforts he made plans he strategized and he had a tactical approach as to how he was going to conquer them the gibeonites had called upon him saying that the kings the five kings were coming against them and what was his strategy and his plan go quickly when they are not aware while they are still planning and do it in the night come against them surprisingly Why did he make all these plans and tactics, even when the Lord had promised him not to be afraid that he was going to destroy those people? Did he relax? Did he just sleep? No, he planned and he executed that plan and having done that, he could now pray. The things he could not do for himself, he requested from God. Reading from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 509, paragraph 1 says, The Spirit of God inspired Joshua's prayer because when he had done all he could, and he saw that the day was waning and night was coming, he prayed for the sun to stand still. So why did he pray? He said God inspired him that evidence might again be given of the power of Israel's God. Hence, his request did not show presumption on the part of the great leader. Joshua had received a promise that God would surely overthrow these enemies of Israel, yet he put forth as earnest effort as though success depended upon the armies of Israel alone. He did all that human energy could do, and then he cried in faith for divine aid. Now hear this, the secret of success is the union of divine power with human effort. Divine power with human effort. Those who achieve the greatest results. You want to achieve the greatest results in that sanitarium, in that school, in that health food store, or in whatever secular business you want to do? Those who achieve the greatest results are those who rely most implicitly on the almighty arm. The man who commanded the sun stand thou still upon Gibeon and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon is the man who for hours lay prostrate upon the earth in prayer in the camp of Gilgal. The men of prayer are the men of power. And also reading from Prophets and Kings page 486 paragraph 3 we are told, Herein is revealed the outworking of the divine principle of cooperation, without which no true success can be attained. Human effort avails nothing without divine power. And without human endeavor, divine effort is with many of no avail. To make God's grace our own, we must act our part. His grace is given to work in us, to will and to do, but never as a substitute for our effort. End of quote. So here is the lesson being taught to us that we must use our own effort and do things that we can do and then depend on God. When the Lord gives us a work to do, he expects us to call to action all the powers of our being and serve him with all our heart, soul, mind and strength. We are not to do a shoddy patchwork job for God. He deserves the best part of our skill, mind, strength and planning. Success in anything depends on how much of our faculties we use for the work. The diligent in business will stand before kings and not before mean men. 
He does not see the man who is prayerful alone will stand before kings or the one who reads his Bible will stand before kings. If we truly are learning from Christ when reading that Bible, we will not dishonor him by doing a patchwork job and by giving mediocre services or laying plans that doesn't have forethought in them and doesn't take take to account the risks and what to do about them. We will learn if we are really studying our Bibles that God has taught us that whatever our hands find to do, we are to do it with all our might. God rewards diligent labor and astute planning. The man who is successful in business plans well. He looks to every possible point of failure and makes sure he does something to cover it or something, a contingency plan for it. He does not leave any stone unturned. He does not leave anything to luck or chance. He does not wait for things to fall in place for him, but does his best to make things fall in place for himself. He does all he can in his own power and then depends on God to do what he cannot do for himself. An example is what we call the SWOT analysis, which I've mentioned before. This is a manner of checking your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and and threats. This manner of viewing things shouldn't be neglected by the one who wants to give glory to God in working for him. God condemns presumption. And those who fail to plan to use their faculties, expecting that they can do things without common sense and without planning, and expect God to bail them out or perform a miracle will be utterly disappointed because that's presumption and they will find that God is not a person like themselves who supports rash actions and immature plans that are not well thought out. Look at the salvation itself, the plan of salvation. Is that not what we call it? It is a plan. There is a strategy that God is following to achieve our own salvation. And if we must have the image and superscription of God, we must plan. God is a planner. He is a strategizer. He has tactics. He takes account, risks, and knows what he's going to do about it. If man sinned, I'm going to die. He had a contingency plan. And for us, of course, that's the only plan he had. No other thing. Just that, if man sinned, I will come and die for him. How about you? Do you make such plans? Some of us, we look at what the Lord is asking us to do, and we just go out in a zeal. Oh, I'm going country living. I want to go and build a place for a sanitarium and all of that, but we don't make our plans and we just get embarrassed because we did not do what we were supposed to do. There's such a thing called the intellect that we can use to make these plans and sometimes in humility, you have to say to yourself, this cannot continue. When you see that whatever business you are going to do cannot sustain itself, then you should close that business. You cannot be doing a business depending on funds coming from somewhere else. No matter even if it is the Lord that told you go and do this work, you have to make out a plan. And when you see that my expenses are going to be more than my returns, you shouldn't go without go on in that business. That is a cash flow risk that you are seeing there. Your business will crumble. It won't stand. So what are you going to depend on? Funds from somewhere else? Is that good planning? No, that's not how God works. But, but of course, that doesn't mean you can't receive help. Nehemiah received help. But how to convince someone to give you the help is what we are talking about. You have to give them a good plan so that they will be convinced and know that this person knows what he or she is doing. So, since we are talking about funds now, how about the funds for God's work? In case you don't have it, what do you do? Well, the first thing you can do is to work for it. You can work for it. And the other thing we can do is what Nehemiah did. So let us just compare Nehemiah and Ezra in this situation. While Ezra refused to receive help from King Artaxerxes, Nehemiah on the other hand had received help from the same king. Was this a double standard from Nehemiah or from Ezra? Was Nehemiah wrong to do this? Now, neither Ezra nor Nehemiah was wrong in what they did. The circumstances that surrounded Ezra was different from that which surrounded Nehemiah. While Ezra found himself in a position where receiving assistance or protection from the king would have been a reproach to God, Nehemiah found himself where to not receive the help would have been the sin of presumption and tempting God. There is nothing wrong in receiving help from the heathen or from people who do not necessarily worship God. As far as there is no strings attached to it that will dishonor God uh, or send a wrong message to the giver, like in the case of Ezra, it was going to send a wrong message if he received it. Or 
there's nothing wrong as far as it doesn't place us in a position where we cannot serve God by keeping his commandments. That's strings attached to it. Maybe somebody tells you, I'll give you this money, but then you will do this for me. And that thing they're asking you to do, you cannot do it. So as far as you, there's not no strings attached to that effect, then there's nothing wrong in receiving the help. If Ezra had received protection after telling the king of how mighty and strong his God is, it would have been a contradiction of the things he had told the king and the king would have lost an opportunity to experience the goodness and power of God. In Nehemiah's case, such consequences were not at stake and also receiving from the king was going to pave the way for other important events when he gets to Jerusalem. We should learn to discern properly when to and when not to receive. But as a general rule, we have to understand that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And if we are given assistance from the hidden, from unbelievers or people not of our faith, it is not wrong to receive except in exceptional cases like that of Ezra or like that of Abraham. When he did not take anything from the king of Sodom because it was going to send a wrong message to them thinking that it was by his own might that he received wealth or that it is the king of Sodom that made him wealthy to stop that impression to ensure that God's glory is not taken away. The same thing with Ezra to ensure that God's glory is intact he refused the help. Remember that many kings like David, Solomon, Asher, Jehoshaphat, Uzziah, Jotham, and almost every king whom God prospered was singled out by the mark that the heathen paid tribute to them, not necessarily by force, but they paid it willingly. Remember the story of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, because he sent teachers all over Israel, the Philistines were willingly, not by force, but they come to Jehoshaphat and willingly give him gifts, take for your kingdom, use it for your work and Jehoshaphat will receive them. He never rejected them and it was not by warfare that he got it, it was just the goodwill that he received from them. Even David received and Solomon they also received. Okay, for a better understanding, let us consider the following reading. This is from Testimonies, Volume 9, page 272 and 273. It says, God's work is now to advance rapidly, and if his people will respond to his call, he will make the possessors of property willing to donate of their means, and thus make it possible for his work to be accomplished in the earth. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Faith in the word of God will place his people in the possession of property which will enable them to work the large cities that are waiting for the message of truth. End of quote. So, from here we see that God is the one who will work on the hearts of those who possess the means or the property and cause them to give. Now, when they give, are we to receive from the example of Nehemiah? Yes. Reading from Councils on Stewardship, page 185, paragraph 1. It says, you inquire with respect to the propriety of receiving gifts from Gentiles or the heathen. The question is not strange, but I would ask you, who is it that owns our world? Who are the real owners of houses and lands? Is it not God? He has an abundance in our world which he has placed in the hands of men by which the hungry might be supplied with food. The naked with clothing, the homeless with homes. The Lord would move upon worldly men, even idolaters, to give of their abundance for the support of the work. If we would approach them wisely and give them an opportunity of doing those things which it is their privilege to do, what they would give we should be privileged to receive end of quote so now look at the other parts that says we should approach them wisely that is with well laid plans but then you are to receive whatever they give with the mindset that all these things it is god's own reading again from councils on stewardship page 187 paragraph 2 we are told there is a wall to be warned and we have been very delicate about calling upon rich men either church members or wardlings to aid us in the work take note of that statement church members or Wardlings. Who is a wardling? It is that entertainment person, that person in the entertainment industry. It is that person who is involved in things of this world and they don't necessarily care about God. Going on, it says, We have been very delicate about calling upon rich men, either church members or wardlings, to aid us in the work. 
we would that all professed Christians stood with us. We would that their souls might be drawn out in liberality, in aiding us in building up the kingdom of God in our world. We should call upon great and good men to help us in our Christian endeavor work. They should be invited to second our efforts in seeking to save that which is lost. End of quote. But then some would ask, are we to receive funds from thieves, prostitutes and corrupt people? There is a passage which we need to justify, which we usually use to justify this in Deuteronomy 23 verse 18 that says, Thou shalt not bring the hire of a whore or the prize of a dog into the house of the Lord thy God for any vow. For even both these are abomination unto the Lord thy God. So, what does this passage mean? As far as I can see, it means exactly what it says, though one could overstretch it to mean something it does not say. A whore is a whore and a dog is a dog, a pimp, one who does the business of sex trafficking or a male prostitute. As far as we want to be like Ezra, taking the Bible literally for what it says, we are not going to take away this passage and say it doesn't mean anything. It means what it says. These are the people that God says their sacrifices should not be received. But does this mean that if their hearts are stirred by God to support a worthy cause, God will not receive their funds? I don't think so. What I see here is that this passage condemns the receiving of sacrifices of these people when it is given as though it is an excuse for the business that they are practicing. Take note that the passage says do not receive their hire for any vow. That's something we usually forget. Deuteronomy 23 verse 18. You shouldn't take their hire into the house of the Lord for any vow. That's what it says. Not that their money should not be received at all. So let us see that the vow is the emphasis. This vow makes us to go to the motive of their giving. Like the lewd woman said to the simple youth in Proverbs 7, listen now, Proverbs 7 verse 13 to 15, that lewd woman that was going to lure someone, she was a prostitute, she's a whore, and she was going to lead someone into sin. And here was what she said when she wanted to lead him into sin. She said, she caught him, she kissed him, and with an impudent face she said unto him, I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. Therefore came I to meet thee diligently, to seek thy face, and I have found thee. She kissed him, that's what he says, and then gave him an excuse as to why her kiss and why her business in general was okay. What did she say? I have given my peace offerings and I have paid my vows. Therefore, I'm coming to meet you. I'm excused in this business I'm doing because I have given my vows. She thinks that her business is sanctified because her peace offerings and tithes were received. This is condemned when one thinks that they can buy forgiveness with their money. And that's why God said, do not receive the hire of a harlot or a dog. A dog is a male prostitute or a pimp, one who conducts the business of prostitution don't receive their money because they are going to be thinking that their business is sanctified because of the money you received from them. But then, let us look at Matthew chapter 21 verse 28 down to 32. Jesus said, But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work. Today in my vineyard, he answered and said, I will not but afterward he repented and went and he came to the second and said likewise and he answered and said i go sir and went not whether of them twain did the will of his father they say unto him the first jesus said unto him verily i say unto you that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of god before you for john came unto you in the way of righteousness and ye believed him not but the publicans and the harlots believed him and ye when you had seen it repented not afterward that you might believe him i've heard some people even say that why did jesus permit that woman that harlot to use perfume from the business that she was doing to wash his feet he shouldn't have received that gesture from her. She was repentant. Don't condemn Jesus, please. He was not receiving the hire of a harlot. He was accepting someone into his kingdom and showing them the evidence that you are not rejected. That's what he was giving to that harlot. Did she make the money for, did she get the perfume from the money she made from harlotry? You don't even know that. You don't know that. 
whether it was something given to her by her father or mother but some people will go as far as saying it was the money she made from her business that she was using to wash the feet of jesus and jesus why is perplexing them why did jesus permit that well you can see you don't even have the evidence that that was what happened and then think about Zacchaeus Jesus told Zacchaeus I'm coming to your house today he was a thief there's no Bible passage that says Jesus was not supposed to eat in the house of the thief but we have one that says you shouldn't receive the higher of a halot and I'm not by any means downgrading that passage it's saying what it says when people want to give this impression that their business is sanctified because they are giving money to the church tell them away with your money we are not going to receive it because you think that you uh, your business can be sanctified because we are receiving the money from you reading from testimonies to ministers page 210 or you can find it in councils on stewardship page 187 paragraph 3 we are told times are growing hard and money is difficult to obtain but god will open the way for us from sources outside our own people i cannot see how anyone can take ex exception to the receiving of gifts from those north of our faith they can only do so by taking extreme views and by creating issues which they are not authorized to do. This is God's world and if God could move upon human agents so that the land which has been in the hands of the enemy may be brought into our hands so that the message may be proclaimed in regions beyond, shall men block up the way by their narrow notions? Such conscientiousness as this is anything but healthful. The Holy Spirit does not lead men to pursue such a course. End of quote. Now, this indeed is where we need to be careful. We can have very narrow views that will bar the way. Many in the church are adulterers, some are liars, some are thieves and mischievous people, they, yet their tithe is taken and no one rejects it. What makes their money more sanctified than the one who is doing some other business that you know of? but maybe because the person is a worldling and is more up, uh, open about their business and then you reject it. But then there are many other sinners in the church. What sin is it that is the one that will say, okay, because this is this sin I want to receive from this person. You see, the real problem is this. The sin of the church, the sin of the clergy, it does not lie in receiving God's money which is in the possession of the sinner. But the sin of the clergy is in preaching smooth messages that will not call the sinner from his sin and tell the sinner that they will be in eternal damnation and using the strongest language possible to arouse them from their sleepy dreamy state. Some even bless the people in their sin. And this is what God condemns when he says don't receive the hire of a hallow. It's almost he's also saying do not bless them in the work they are doing. Condemn it in the strongest language possible. Today people are blessing people who are doing a work that is evil and they are not telling them to go and work in a place that is diligent and something that's they are not telling them go and work diligently or do a business that is honest they support them in their evil they are telling people who are not serving god it shall be well it shall be well with you that is the problem that the church has that the clergy has Reading again from Councils on Stewardship, page 188, paragraph 1 down to 3, it says, Why not ask the Gentiles for assistance? I have received instruction that there are men and women in the world who have sympathetic hearts and who will be touched with compassion as the needs of suffering humanity are presented before them. There are men in the world who will give of their means for schools and for sanitariums. The matter has been presented to me in this light. Our work is to be aggressive. The money is the Lord's and if the wealthy are approached in the right way, the Lord will touch their hearts and impress them to give of their means. God's money is in the hands of these men and some of them will heed the request for help. T talk this over and do all in your power to secure gifts. We are not to feel that it would not be the thing to ask men of the world for means, for it is just the thing to do. This plan was opened before me as a way of coming in touch with wealthy men of the world. Through this means, not a few will become interested and may hear and believe the truth for this time." End of quote. And this applies to someone like Zacchaeus.
Zacchaeus was a tax collector and it was by receiving from him that Jesus worked his conversion and that's what we're learning now that through these means of laying down plans and giving them to those who are worldly and explaining to them what we ought to do and what we want to do that not a few of them a good number of them will become interested in the work and they will hear and believe the truth for this time that was how God worked with Zacchaeus Jesus worked out his salvation this way. Is Jesus condemned for, for eating from the food of a man who was a public thief, a Yahoo boy, an internet fraudster? He was a 419er. No, he isn't, except we are the judge and can tell me which commandment prohibits a man from eating food. Should a child refuse to receive funds from their parents because they are sure that their parents tell lies or they maybe broke God's commandments to get the job maybe by falsifying documents or something should the child now go as far as saying oh daddy mommy since you changed your age in this government job that you got which is a sin of course and then I'll take it as far as saying because of that I'm not going to work with you I'm not going to collect funds from you are you holier than God he worked with Nebuchadnezzar he worked with Cyrus and these men weren't all perfect people and God knew that quite all right but he'd still worked with them and even all the kings of Israel some of them were in polygamy which is a sin and God still worked with them we shouldn't take things and overstretch them to the point where our over conscientiousness will be a sin there are cases where it is necessary for someone not to receive things like in the case of Ezra and we have already looked at that but that is an exceptional case here the Lord is teaching us two lessons, the lesson of diligence in business and also the lesson of having the mind that is not narrow but broad to understand that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, all the things in this world belong to God. And if we secure the gifts like Nehemiah did from the king, our conscientiousness shouldn't make us feel like, oh, this man is a politician, this man is corrupt, this man is evil therefore i will not receive anything from him no we shouldn't do that god hasn't given us any such command and we are to secure these means as the lord opens the way may the lord give us more understanding of his word let us pray thank you dear father for giving us this word today i pray lord that you forgive us for the times that we have been lackluster in our work not strategizing and not making efforts to improve ourselves in project management and business skills and how to accomplish things with the strength and intellect and mind that you have given to us. Forgive us for misrepresenting you if we have done things like this and we pray Lord teach us. Help us to grow. Help us Lord to understand these things so that we can become better workmen for you. Thank you Lord for hearing our prayers and we pray Lord that you will help us to so present things in a way that can be convincing to the mind of those who have the means that we may get the favors that we cannot get by our own strength and that we may have opportunities by, by which we may glorify your name. Help us Lord to also wait till the time when the opportunity comes and not to be overzealous and do things that is not yet time to do. Thank you Lord for hearing and answering us in Jesus name I pray. Amen. Thank you.